And those of you who are married, you know that uh, even though it's fun to stroll down memory lane and look back at those images, it takes more than a great wedding photo or a wonderful wedding day to make a marriage. A lot more. And that's what we're going to talk about here this morning when we come in our series in Ephesians to Ephesians chapter 5. I don't know if you've noticed this, but our culture has, I think, an unrealistic view of what marriage is. Both unrealistically positive and unrealistically negative. On the unrealistically positive side, I, for example, I, I've heard people say things like, you know, it, as long as we are just in love and we love each other, everything will just be fine. I had a couple that came to see me for premarital counseling, and the young man was engaged with his fiance. They sat across my desk from me, and he said, you know, Pastor Jeff, my parents really think this is a good idea, but we don't really need this kind of thing. I said, why not? He goes, well, we are so in love. This is not really for us, but this, we don't want to fight with our parents. Because we're so in love, we don't need the premarital counseling. And I thought, well, that's exactly why you need it. <laughs> <laughs> On the unrealistically negative side, I think people understandably say things like, well, the divorce rate's 50% plus in our culture. I mean, as a whole, it's about a 50-50 proposition, so why risk it? It's just a piece of paper. Why get married? What's the point of that? If half of them or more end in divorce, why not just live together and try it out? And in fact, cohabitation, living together, is 70% more common than it was 50 years ago in 1968. In the same time span, 50 years, five decades, the divorce rate has more than doubled, while the number of people getting married has dropped by 33%. You don't have to be a scientist or a genius to figure out that fewer and fewer people are getting married, and more and more of those who do, their marriages are ending in divorce. It's not a good sign in our culture. Something's wrong in our culture when it comes to how we think about marriage. Ironically, there is increasing research that's saying that those who choose to stay married find themselves, on the whole, happier, healthier, more fulfilled. Perhaps I think the biggest change has been in how we think about what marriage is and what it's for. New York Times uh, op-ed writer David Brooks, uh, who wrote a book called The Road to Character, it's a really good book, and he writes this, the older ideal of marriage as a permanent contractual union between a man and a woman designed for the sake of mutual love procreation, and protection is slowly but surely giving way to a new reality where marriage is a terminal sexual contract designed for the gratification of the individual parties. And that's exactly right over the last 50 years in our culture. The prevailing cultural view is that marriage is about chemistry. It's about someone to make you happy. Finding that perfect person to, in the words of Jerry Maguire, complete you. That, that partner that will make you complete. But the Bible gives a very, very different picture of what marriage is. Now, some of, for some of you, many of you are here and you are married, or you're hoping to be someday, or maybe you're engaged. I realize for some of you, this is a painful subject. If you're here and you're single, or maybe your marriage ended badly, you're thinking, oh, great, the marriage talk. I just would encourage you that God has something to say to you, wherever your spot in life is on this issue, and it matters for all of us. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 5 as we continue in our series called Built to Last, looking at Paul's great letter to the Christians living in Ephesus and to us today, the church today. We'll begin in verse 18, the second half of verse 18. Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, and gave himself up for her. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. 
However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is probably the central text on marriage in the New Testament. There are many others, but this is one of the key teachings on marriage. And I know there's sort of a proverbial elephant in the room right now, the S word, submission. I promise we're going to get to that. So just hold that, you know, hang in there. We'll get to what that really means if that's tripping you up. But actually, uh, the reason we started in verse 18, some people read the Ephesians 5 and they think, well, you know, Paul's talking about being filled with the Spirit, and then he sort of changes subjects and he talks about marriage. The reason we started reading this text in verse 18 is because it's one continuous thought. He's saying, be filled with the Spirit of God. Going back to chapter 2, right? When you trust in Jesus Christ, the Spirit seals you, comes into your life. You get a new spiritual life. Be filled with that Spirit. And then he goes on to talk about what living a spirit-filled life looks like in a marriage. In chapter 6, he'll talk about parents and children, and then masters and servants in the workplace, in other words. In every area of our lives, then, what does it look like to live out our gospel identity filled with the Spirit? So he's not changing subjects, and it's very important to understand what he's saying to get that context right. This is about being filled with the Spirit, and he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands. Now, actually, the way the Greek construction of the sentence reads, it reads more like this. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives to husbands. Husbands, give yourself up for your wives. Mutual submission out of reverence for Jesus Christ is the umbrella under which Paul talks about this. That's important to understand. So Paul's not saying, okay, I've talked to you about the Spirit, now I'm going to change subjects and talk to you about marriage. It's all one subject. This is the essence of marriage. Paul's giving us the essence of marriage. Our culture believes the essence of marriage is about chemistry, right? Compatibility. Finding that perfect person to meet your needs and complete you. Guys who are married here, ladies who are married here, I'm going to ask you a question. When you kiss your spouse now, does it feel the same as the first kiss? If you say yes, you're lying. Right? <laughs> Right? It, sh- it doesn't, and it shouldn't. Because that first kiss is, is about what? Chemistry, right? Oh, this girl, this, la- this wonderful, amazing woman who I think is so awesome is, is, is into me, right? There's something electric about that. But it's about me, right? It's about what I'm feeling, what I'm getting. It's ego driven. That feels a certain way, but it's not actually what the Bible means by love. We'll come back to that. The essence of marriage is not chemistry or electricity or romance even. Both Paul and Jesus quote the Old Testament passage, Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. In the creation account, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Two man and woman becoming one is the essence of marriage. God ordained marriage in the first book of the Bible. Then Jesus, in, John, in Matthew 19, quotes this, saying, Have you not read that he who created them from the, getting, from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man will leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Jesus reaffirms what God said in Genesis. And then Paul in Ephesians, we just read this, quotes the same passage. So God says it, Jesus affirms it, and Paul reaffirms it. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, the old King James translation of this says a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Leave and cleave. Because what's happening here is the Bible's talking about what's called a covenant. it's, It's a binding promise. And in the Old Testament, Hebrew way was to cut a covenant. There was always blood sacrifice involved in a covenant. So you leave and you cleave. There's a covenant happening, a binding promise being made. A covenant is not a promise to feel a certain way over your lifetime. Think back to your wedding day, those of you who are married, or any marriage you've attended, those of you who aren't. When they take their vows, what are they promising? I promise to always feel warm and fuzzy around you. I promise to always feel a certain way. Can you promise your feelings tomorrow? Can you promise how you will feel? No, you can't. You could eat weird chili tonight and feel strange tomorrow, and you can't control that, right? You can't promise how you're going to feel. 
What you're promising is I will be faithful to you. I will love you. I will serve you regardless of how I feel in the future. That's biblical love. Very different from what our culture defines as love. It's not feeling. It's not emotion. Those come and go. You can't promise your feelings, but you can pledge your faithfulness. I'm going to read to you a quote from, I know, C.S. Lewis, but I'm just telling you, there's a reason he keeps coming up. Uh, and I read, the, I read the same quote at every wedding that I do. Being in love is a good thing, but it's not the best thing. There are many things below it, but there are also things above it, and you cannot make it the basis of a whole life. It is a noble feeling, but it is still just a feeling. And no feeling can be relied upon to last in its full intensity or even to last at all. And in fact, whatever people say, the state called being in love usually does not last. But of course, ceasing to be in love need not mean ceasing to love. Love in this second sense, love as distinct from being in love, is not merely a feeling. It's a deep unity maintained by the will and deliberately strengthened by habit reinforced in a Christian marriage by the grace which both partners ask and receive from God. And they can have this love for each other even in moments when they don't like each other very much. They can retain this love. Being in love first moves them to promise faithfulness. But this quieter, deeper, stronger love enables them to keep the promise. It is on this love that the engine of marriage is meant to be run. Being in love is just the spark that started it. It's exactly right and profoundly biblical. Our culture says the essence of marriage is that feeling of being in love. The Bible says you can't make a life on that. You can't base a life together on that. Now I don't have to tell you that this is at odds with what our culture says the essence of marriage is. As I mentioned, chemistry is about ego. It's about what you're receiving, how you're being made to feel, how, how your needs are being met by that person. Really, if you think about it, our culture's view is, is a consumer relationship. What am I receiving? But the biblical view is a covenant relationship. I want you to see this, this uh, chart here, which will give you a comparison of consumer and covenant relationships. In a consumer relationship, you are the priority. It's about your needs. In a covenant relationship, the other person is the priority. In a consumer relationship, you're focused on your needs and desires. In a covenant relationship, on the other person's needs and desires. And this is true, by the way, for any Christian relationship, but it's specifically a marriage. Consumer relationships flare, out, flare up and flame out quickly. They're insecure and unstable because it could end at any time. And look at that last one. It's actually less free and intimate despite all the rhetoric. Why so? Because it doesn't have the protection. It doesn't have the safe circle of protection that I'm committed to you no matter what comes. There isn't that security. And so, by definition, there's less intimacy. Be worth your time to think about this in your marriage relationships or your relationships in general. So the essence of marriage is a covenant. W.H. Auden, not a Christian, poet and social commentator, he wrote this quote, which I thought was so interesting. Like everything which is not the involuntary result of fleeting emotion, but the creation of time and will, any marriage is infinitely more interesting than any romance, no matter how passionate. It's a secular poet of the previous generation. Isn't that interesting? He says, like anything that just happens by fleeting t romance, the involuntary result of fleeting emotion. But if it's the creation of time and will, I find it infinitely more interesting than that which comes and goes. The binding promise of future love is far more powerful than a declaration of present feeling. This is the power of marriage. The power of marriage. There's great transformative power in covenant relationships, in, in Christian relationships, and certainly in a marriage. Look back again for a minute at, at chapter uh, 5, verse 18 through 21. Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. <laughs> what does that mean? It means when you leave here, you have to sing your goodbyes. 
see you tomorrow. Like, you know, that's right. No. <laughs> Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Those two commands, be filled with the Spirit and submit to one another, are central to what Paul is saying here. The idea of being filled with the Spirit is really interesting because he's going back to his earlier teachings. Now remember, in chapters 1 through 3 of Ephesians, Paul is hammering away at who you are in Christ, who Jesus is, what he did, why that matters, how that should shape your identity as a man or a woman. Be filled with that realization, the Spirit that leads you into that. Remember Ephesians 3, verses 16 through 19, where Paul says this about what the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, does in us. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I love that passage. When he says be filled with the spirit, why? so that you would grasp the greatness of God's love, that being filled with God's Spirit gives you the spiritual ability and power to surrender your needs and live for the the good of someone else. And when you do that, you get a glimpse of what God's love is like that you cannot get from personal study or reading. When you give your life away in service to someone else, when you care about their needs ahead of your own, you're learning about the love of God experientially. You're beginning to grasp the height and depth and length and breadth of God's love. This is the spiritual power of marriage through mutual submission and self-sacrifice for the good of the other person. But here's the mistake so many couples make that I, in my experience, you, you, or couples to be, if you're here and you're not married and you're hoping someday that God might give you that gift, you're praying for that. Or perhaps your marriage ended badly and you're wondering if there would ever be a second chance for you. Whatever the case, one of the mistakes I think so many of us make is this. We make our spouse or future spouse out to be the ultimate source of love in our life. Like this person, I need their love to be okay. And when you do that, you lose out in two ways. Number one, you're trying to get from that human being what only God can give you. And therefore, you can't get what God wants to give you because you're trying to get it from the wrong person. Make sense? And second, you can't receive what your spouse is meant to give you because you're trying to get something else from them that only God can give you. You're a double loser, in other words. I love my wife. You saw how amazingly beautiful she is. And she's talented and she's just incredible. But she's not the ultimate source of love in the universe for me. And if I try to make her that, I lose on both ends. And so does she. Because no human being can give you only what God was meant to give you. Perfect security, love, acceptance. You get that in only one place. So those of you who are married, or someday will be married, it's really important we get that straight. I, wanna, I love my wife best when she's not the most important love in my life, when Christ is. I don't love her less, I love him more, Right? And out of that love fills me to love her well. Husbands and wives, look to the love of God for you in Jesus Christ. Future husbands and wives, look to the love of God for you in Jesus Christ. This gives you the spiritual power you need to love well. Let's talk about the purpose of marriage. Again, what's the dominant view in our culture about the purpose of marriage? basically to make us happy, to enhance our lives in some way. Let me read verses 25 through 27 again of chapter 5 for you, particularly you men, pay attention. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. What's the goal of a husband in a marriage? To help make his wife holy. To see her become more like the woman God made her to be. The wife's goal is the same. Gary Thomas, in his book, Sacred Marriage, said, God did not give us marriage. purpose of marriage is not to make us happy, 
but to make us holy. Now, I have to say it's not to make you miserable either. But if you make, hap- if you make your personal happiness the goal of your marriage, that's the fastest route to being miserable. If you make If I make my happiness my goal, it's a certainty that I'm going to be frustrated and sad and miserable. But here's something interesting. When I make her happiness my goal, a very interesting thing happens. I'm filled up. I'm full of joy. I find something greater than circumstantial happiness. It's common to hear people say things like this, and I've heard this many times. You know, I just want to find that person who accepts me for who I am and won't try to change me. Mm. If you're thinking about marriage as a way of not being changed, you should not get married. (laughs) Lou Smeads, in one of his books uh, called Forgive and Forget about marriage, he says, over 50 years my wife's been married to five different men, and they've all been me. (laughs) The Bible says you need to change. You need to be transformed. You're not okay as you are. And if you think marriage is just going to be like, don't mess with me, but meet my needs, you're not ready for marriage. You need a partner who will change you, who God will use to change you. As a matter of fact, when you think about a a, a future spouse, for those of you who aren't married or hope someday that you might have a second chance at love and be married, what are you looking for? Physical attraction? I know we say, like I always say to my wife, you're, you're so beautiful to me. She says, stop adding to me to that phrase. <laughs> you say, oh, honey, you're as beautiful as the day I met you. And I might mean that, but objectively, and she's probably not. I mean, my wife is, but the rest of you. Right? <laughs> my point is, Paul says, outwardly we're wasting away, right? You're not getting more attractive. You're getting uglier. <laughs> and so am I. Physical beauty fades, but spiritual beauty grows. All kidding aside, when I, when I was getting to know my wife, she, she, she was, I was stru- stunned by her physical beauty. But as I got to know her, she spent a summer at Amsterdam in the red light district working as a missionary with a group of students reaching out to girls caught in the sex traffic in- industry and homeless people and drug addicts. And she kept a spiritual journal. And when she came back, we began to talk about her experience and she shared some of her prayers in that journal. I vividly remember being so struck by the depth of her faith, so attracted to her love for God, her relationship with Jesus. I thought, this woman, in addition to being a stone-cold fox, right, will also help me grow. I've got some growing to do. You should be looking for someone who's going to help you become the man or woman God made you to be, and you should be looking for someone that you can do the same for. That's the goal of marriage, to make you holy. God giving you a partner, and this is not easy. We talk about around here for, for where you are as a church. Grace for where you are. It's okay for you not to be okay around here. But you're not supposed to stay that way. We all have some growing to do. In a marriage, two people come together to partner with God's spirit to help each other become who God made them to be. Timothy Keller uses his illustration in in, in the meaning of marriage of a gem tumbler. I don't know what this was, but you put uncut gems. They look like rocks, really in this machine with water and other sand and other rocks, and you, they just, you, you crank it, they tumble around. Over time, you know what happens to them? Over, they come out shining and beautiful. But inside, it's rough. They're banging around in there, knocking against each other, and it's, it can be painful. The point is, in a marriage, it's not always easy and smooth. It's difficult. There are two imperfect people coming together, like in a gem tumbler, getting knocked around, but God is using that to refine you to grow you, to shape you. Now, there's one other final purpose of marriage, but before we talk about that, I I, I promised you we'd get to the the, the elephant in the room, the S word. Are you ready to talk about it? Or maybe not. So you're like, I'm not so sure. It depends what you're going to say. The S word, submission. It's a controversial word in our culture. Uh, It's one that people automatically think is about power and control. It's not so. Like the, I think we think about it like this. Like, well, it, what it means is if a husband and wife are shopping for a car and the man wants a blue car and the wife wants a red car, the man goes, well, honey, Ephesians 5, we're going red. <laughs> and she goes, uh-uh, Ephesians 5, give yourself up for her, we're going blue. So you get a purple car. No, that's not. <laughs> it's not about that at all. It's not about who calls the shots. That's not what Paul is talking about. Contrary to cultural opinion, Years ago, I had a couple sit across my desk in premarital counseling, and one of the things I would do with them is I'd have them read Ephesians 5 together. 
you know, a verse each. And we came to this verse 22, wives, submit to your husbands and everything as to the Lord. She stopped reading. She just stared down at the desk. When I asked her why she stopped, she looked up at me and said through clenched teeth, I hate that verse. Don't you dare read that at my wedding. And as I got to know her, I found out that she grew up in a family where that verse was used as a kind of spiritual club to keep her mom down by her father. A lot of dysfunction and pain. And I just want to say as a pastor, kind of representative here, if that's your experience, it's wrong. It's wrong, and it grieves me. It breaks my heart, and it breaks God's heart that we would use that to demean women, to be spiritually abusive even. The church should be leading the way, especially at this stage in our culture, in, 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 in elevating each other, men and women. And historically, it hasn't always been so. But we make an additional mistake if we just dismiss it then and say, well, it's out of date, it's archaic, it's, it's, you know, it's chauvinistic, and we need to move on from that. Paul's saying something very profound and relevant to us if we understand. He's not talking about power and control. He places the issue of husbands and wives and submission in the context of being filled with the Spirit and mutual submission out of reverence for Christ. Now, there's no denying that the Bible does teach a difference in the genders. That's, just, that's not chauvinistic or misogynistic. It's just true. Men and women are not the same. Their roles are not the same. It has nothing to do with value or dignity or status. It's, there's a difference. But what Paul is saying here is wives submit your husbands as the Lord. But nobody talks about what the husband has to do. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. All men, right now, I want you to listen. If you're married or, or to be married, I want you to listen for a minute. Nobody talks about what the husband's supposed to do. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How, guys, did he love the church? Not rhetorical. You can answer out loud. How did he, how did he love the church? Look over there if you're confused. He died. So wives have to submit, but men, you have to die. Who has the harder job? And it's not talking about taking a bullet or jumping in front of a train. I know that I would do that. I'd, I'd save my wife and children. But it's talking about a profoundly more difficult death. Dying to my need to have my way. Dying to my selfishness. To put her needs ahead of mine. Second only to Christ. Is that the Holy Spirit? <laughs> <laughs> The ultimate example is of Jesus. All authority on earth and heaven given to him. What does Philippians chapter 2 say? He laid aside his authority and submitted himself to the will of the Father and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. I do believe the Bible teaches that men have spiritual leadership responsibility in the home. But in Scripture, leadership and authority is only ever given for one reason, for one purpose. To lay it down in service to others. This is where we get tripped up. We try to import cultural definitions of leadership and authority into the Bible. And in our culture, it's all of you exist for me. Politicians think this way. CEOs think this way. But the biblical definition of leadership is I f exist for all of you. I give up my rights. I surrender my need to have my way so that you could flourish, so that you could be elevated. So men, your call is to give yourself up for your wife to be looking for ways to present her holy. How can I help her become the woman God made her to be? How can I surrender to my need to have my way? How can I give up my desires so that she would flourish? And women, if you find a man who's dying to himself for you, or trying to, and I fall short of this. Submission is not a problem, isn't it? You want to follow that guy. But the problem is we focus on what the other person's supposed to do. She's not submitting. He's not being a spiritual leader. Get your eyes on what you're called to do how you're called to live. And if you're not married here, start behaving in this way. Start learning to live in submission to other people out of reverence for Christ. You don't get your rights by demanding them. You give them up. Because that's what Jesus did for you. He gave them up. Wives, you've been called by God to submit to the man God has joined you to. It doesn't mean he gets to have his way. He needs you. You have no idea what it does to a man's heart when you tell him that you respect him. When you tell him that I want to follow you. 
Even if you're not always sure you mean it <laughs> when you tell them you believe in him. And men, you have no idea what it does to a woman's heart when you continually put aside your needs and your selfishness and look for ways to see her flourish, to see her lead, to see her grow. How dare we use this as a way to keep demean people and keep people down? It's not at all what Paul intended or what God's vision for a marriage. And here's the last part. The, the ultimate meaning of marriage is this. You know how the Bible ends? You know how the story of the Bible ends? In Revelation chapter 19, let's skip ahead there. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory for the what? Marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. At the end of the story of the Bible, the end of history is a great wedding feast, a marriage. Paul says in Ephesians 5.32, I'm saying this refers to Christ in the church. The ultimate meaning of marriage, earthly Christian marriage, between a man and a woman on earth, is to be a picture to the world of Jesus Christ's love for his people. When you, men, give yourselves up for your wives, when you, wives, follow your husband and love him and serve him, when you submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, when you forgive each other, when you lay aside your need to have your way, the world gets a little glimpse of how good God is. I don't know about you, but I think our world is in desperate need of more glimpses of that, don't you? We fight in our culture about the meaning of marriage and stuff. The best thing we could do is to start taking this seriously. Start learning to live the way God has called us to live. Our world needs a picture of what it's supposed to be like. A compelling picture of the love between a man and a woman which points to God's love for his bride. And for those of you who aren't married, and it's a painful subject for you, the greatest act of spousal love in history is the cross. Jesus calls himself your groom, and we're his bride. Of all the images and metaphors he could have chosen, he chose that one. That's how he loves us. Let's pray together. Father, we pause and acknowledge that your word is true, and sometimes we're informed by the culture or we just forget. But for everybody here, for my brothers and sisters who are married, for those for whom this is a painful subject or they're hoping someday that they might be given this gift of marriage, Father, it matters. Marriage matters to all of us because ultimately it's a picture of your love your love for us through Christ. And whatever our situation in life, this is how you love us, as a groom loves his bride. We thank you for that, that you're, we're not, you don't love us because we're lovely, Lord. Your love makes us lovely. We praise you, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.